Hey, yeah, thanks. So just uh, curious about the far out of my puts that I have either been bought or sold to hedge for on like every strike January or July 15th and like it goes way up and like I mean I know that they say apes are buying all the calls so they're probably selling the 145s just to sell a ton of them that are expired worthless but there's a considerable hedge it seems like on the put side um so I think part of it might have to do with the um convert or I'm sorry, with the uh, capital structure arbitrage that I articulated earlier. If you wanted to, instead of shorting the stock uh, on this this arbitrage, you could buy the debt and buy those puts, um, depending on the price. Um, and that way you don't, you know, shorting the stock can be a little weird if you don't want to pay the borrow costs and you think the borrow costs may jump. Now, of course, there's no arbitrage there either, I once thought about, okay, well, if I don't want to pay borrow costs on some of the hard to borrow shorts I was doing, let me just buy puts. The smart people that make markets and, and, and puts and things like that figure that out and, and, and price that in as well. So there's no easy way to do that. Now, I don't know exactly why there's all these puts uh, traded. I don't, I'm actually not paying attention to that. It's not my cup of tea, to be frank. Like, to me, it's a lot. Anytime an option has 100,000 contracts outstanding, that that's actually quite a lot. Oh, no, not one, one strike. It's like all of the strikes, all the puts. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a little better. That's still quite a bit, I would say. I mean, but it's, it's you know, not that crazy, I guess. Basically, all the puts from 50 going upwards all have anywhere from 100 or something to... You know, hundreds, not thousands, but every strike's got hundreds. I'm just a stock jock. You know, I think the uh, the vol side is a little bit different. Um, you know, clearly there's a lot of trading going on here. Uh, it's very kind of like volatile stock. But for me, I prefer to think about if an auction were held today where 15 or 20 private equity companies were taken into a room by Goldman Sachs and... Goldman Sachs says, hey, you know, you guys have a lot of capital. Carlisle, KKR, Blackstone, Berkshire Hathaway, the who's who, you know, come up. You have two weeks of unfettered due diligence. Come up with a bid where you can buy this company, put in a bid. I think most people would bid for $10, $12, maybe $14, and that's about it. You know, I don't think anybody in their right mind would, would sign and seal a, an offer letter for $25 a share. Nor do I think anybody would really seal a sign and seal an offer and say, you know, we'll pay $2. Uh, it's not worth that much. You know, I think a sober, rational investor would uh, would pay uh, roughly that much. And I know that's like frustrating because like I got a lot of downvotes for this, which was funny because a friend of mine said, oh, I saw you said they saw, did the AMC thing. What? So what, what was uh, your ver the verdict? And I said, the bulls are pissed at me and the bears are pissed at me. <laughs> and, you know, the bulls wanted to go to a thousand dollars a share which is delusional but the bears wanted to go to five cents uh which is also delusional it's a valuable business i mean movies aren't disappearing and it's it's a pretty sweet business uh so i, I think that uh if it goes low enough Wait, I, which bear said that i i've continually said that it's not going bankrupt well good for you but you're not the whole the world doesn't revolve around you amy even though my well, world that, my world might so revolve around you about it. i don't know i, I think I think there's plenty of people that think they are going to default and go bankrupt. So um, you're basically talking about this idea of the market being an information arbitrage system. Yeah. Um, but the problem I feel like is, you know, is it a? This, this might sound funny, but is it like a vibe arbitrage system? Because although like everyone knows that you know there are these headsets and and, and Meta is working. On, on with reality labs all, all the engineers like they haven't really tried it out they haven't really vibed out with it and like i just felt what, it, what it's going to be like right i know a lot of people who hate vr that they feel like they want to throw up after five minutes in it just because you're a fan exactly. doesn't yeah because it's like a primitive form of the, of the technology right like you can't <laughs> they've been saying that for a long time now man <laughs> some people think that's never going away i mean the thing is like the the motion sickness only only really happens like it's like the thing like you, you've got to really like drink the snake poison a bit and then it stops like after you kind of throw up once but some people don't want to do that you know <laughs> yeah i mean that is that is a pretty big, big barrier and friction but so yeah i mean i, I mean I, it's for those of us those that don't know exactly what we're talking about here there was there was a, a hash mentioned and it's not a stupid or silly thought but he mentioned kind of and it's important to have these thoughts if you ever read my blog they're full of them uh, I think it's important to be creative and there's value in that. Uh, the creative idea he had was that in the long run, we're not going to watch films 
in uh, movie theaters will watch them on VR. And I don't think that's crazy at all. Uh, I think it's just unlikely. Um, but it's not impossible. But I think for the next 10 years of cash flow, it probably won't make a difference. Uh, but these things creep up quick, so maybe it will. I don't know. But... I, mean, I think the idea is a bit more nuanced than that. Like, this, basically, Zuckerberg talks about... Um... You know, anything that is a screen that we use, and not even just screens, but you, know, you, you can think of a clock as the same way when you have a clock hanging on your, on your room or, or a poster or things like that where there's ornaments that you don't really touch or feel, but they're, they're in your house and they're all around you. Remember, you're talking to the guy that tried to put 10 million bucks into Oculus after first trying it, so I'm That's with you. That's right. You know. You're talking to the guy who's been playing, like, who's been on it for like, you know, hours every, every, every week for the past like, you know, four or five years. Yeah, but, you know, I mean, I'm a fan, too, but it doesn't mean everybody else is a fan, and it doesn't mean that, you know, I mean, I'm a fan of a lot of weird things. I like to play chess, you know, I like to, you know, play League of Legends, I like to uh, program in my hey, spare time, yo. I like to, you know, it doesn't mean it's right for everybody, and I think VR will have its use, but there's 250 million people that watch, go to the, the cinema every year, and, you know, it, it's, it's just, I don't think going to be what replaces America's pastime, at least overnight. Um, right, but 20, 30 years from now, sure, why not? But, you know, that's not our, that's not kind of our, our job to worry about as investors, at least for today and tomorrow. I mean, well, it is move. all about habits, really, as, as you're saying, and we will, we might break these, it might take some time to break these habits, but. It may never happen. Predicting the future is notoriously difficult, especially when there's uncertainty involved. But with the market down 20% on the year, what's your outlook for the rest of the year? Or better yet, how are you positioned? And then number two is, what's your chess elo? Uh, great question. So uh, I don't like like to follow beta. So for me, um, I think um, you know, cash, shorts, longs, everything like those three components of the portfolio are, are just important to have, no matter what the market's doing. And I think when the market's going up, it feels silly and it feels stupid that you know you're you're losing money on shorts a friend of mine gave up he was one of the biggest uh hedge fund managers period but uh definitely like the biggest or second biggest biotech hedge fund manager and we used to short stocks together all the time and he's like Marin, i gave up i gave up on shorting it's just i never make money shorting anymore and i was like all right man but you know i know it's painful but eventually you know all these stocks will, will be shorts and of course you know not a moment too soon but within a year you know, the, the biotech market went to one of the worst bear markets it's ever had. So like, you know, it just feels bad to short sometimes. Um, but the reality is like, it's, it's necessary. Stocks get overvalued, stocks get undervalued. And right now, you know, we're seeing kind of one side of it. Um, it's probably, we're getting to a point maybe where that's going to boomerang back, but hell if I know, you know, who, who can really predict that? Who has had a track record of predicting that over the long run? Very few people can, can boast that they can predict turns in the market. So for me, at the very least, it seems more realistic that I can predict turns in one industry and, and say, all right, based on my one industry, I can kind of get a sense for, um, you know, biopharma, for instance. And and I think uh, over the long run, I've sort of proven that that's the case for me, but it's been hard won. I mean, I've had a lot of uh, problems over the years trading biopharma. I finally feel like I got my footing sort of 10 years after starting. Um and, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that, um, you know, but um, in any event, I think the trying to predict the, the stock market is pretty difficult for me. Uh, I've also made more money as an entrepreneur than I have as an investor. Uh, so what I've done is I put all my money in my drug companies. And if my drug companies see good investments, I expect them to make those investments so they can kind of trade. And that's also worked for me right now. I'm in some litigation. So kind of my positioning is, is basically irrelevant to a certain extent. I've one big position that I'm working out uh, across a bar barrage of lawsuits and things like that. But thankfully the position's still worth quite a lot. Uh, but it, I have one large, long private equity position basically. Um, but that's a whole other story, so. So here's where I have the problem, man. Like, help me out here, right? We literally have a DOG, DOJ investigation, right? A sealed indictment that went out against Wang and Archegos. Yeah. And in that, it basically states that one one fund, right? Essentially, one person yep. took away the entire supply and demand yep. of the ticker 
right? Through through what? He he did it, man. I mean, you and, and anybody can do that, you know. Uh, if you got the scratch, the problem with him is he didn't have the scratch, <laughs> so he was sort of faking well, I mean, it. He had, so he he make had it. the scratch. And he had the scratch until no, he he, him, right? he didn't really because he misled his creditors as to how much money he had. So he was borrowing like ten, twenty, thirty x what he had. But yeah, when, no, a hundred percent. But if it didn't move against them, he still he still got it, right? Like hey, if the bank if the bank will lend you the money, but if you're borrowing it under false pretenses, I think that's kind of like it's still I mean, fraud. Because of that Arquegos case, Credit Suisse got really jammed up, didn't they? Yeah. Specifically yeah. specifically with ties to GME. They, right? they they closed my account, unfortunately. Completely changed one of the biggest banks in the world business model. I wouldn't say it changed the business model, but it it, it changed it the banks. It, no, 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 no. They're, they're, it was the fraud. It was their the fraud their business the model bank. their business model is the same. I think that their their risk controls is changing, but they're 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 still investment bank. They're still doing investment banking. I mean, they didn't decide to get into the gold business. Um, they're still uh, <laughs> nice, very nice, Martin. Very yeah, nice. yeah, yeah. Nice so, little shot there. Yeah, they're still they're still trading stocks and underwriting debt and things like that. I think they're they're double checking their clients' books first before they're lending them billions of dollars. But you know, that's a whole other well, story. Yeah, I want to make it. I want to. I want to ask you too. Like, you understand that the fraud was between the banks, right? Like, so his the banks that he was taking all of this money from. Certainly. Yeah, I didn't, know. didn't know about the other banks. The man read. The man read the indictment. I don't know how anybody doesn't have that problem. Like, if if something moves the wrong way, are we one day away from financial disaster around the world? No, I think that. Uh, how do you, how do you say no? Nothing has changed, Martin. Yeah, but that's the funny thing about Wall Street. If you read that book I mentioned, uh, John Steele Gordon's uh, "The Great Game," which is this great history of Wall Street. There have been charlatans, frauds, and and criminals from the day one of Wall Street. You're talking to one right now. Like, I, I, I understand. And that's my point, right? That's you know, it never ends. That, and and on, and one last one last quick point and, is that sometimes it's hard to tell who the criminal is and who isn't, depending on the day 100%, of the week. A hundred percent. I'll make the conditions with me, right? Playing tiger cub, right? Tiger, you just mentioned. What's his name? Got crushed this year. Yeah, Gabe. Uh, I'm sorry, Chase. Yeah. Right. So how, how many? How many? Gabe, Gabe was a tiger. tiger a lot of people don't know, but tiger. Gabe, Gabe at Melvin was a tiger cub too. There, there you go. How many tiger cubs are running firms out there? Uh, there's like thirty or forty or fifty of us. That, that's terrifying. Now let me bring you. To well, they're pretty good investors, mind you, but. Well, you, I'm sure if you're fixing the game. No, there's no fixing of the game. What, what, you're making a big leap there. Yeah, and Pete, this is kind of what, like this is kind of where I get like, oh, I, I get a lot of everything doesn't tie back to your stock because you love it as much. Jamie, as you I'm, do. I'm so far off AMC. It's not even. Fun. Yeah, he's, he's not bringing like, up AMC. Okay. AMC is like AMC is like. I don't mean that in a bad way. Right? Like I truly believe that AMC, GME, and several other takers, right. as we found out through. No, that's that's my bad. I I made an assumption. That's my bad. I mean, Huang had yeah, like something. 136 billion of exposure to a billion dollars worth of actual equity, right? Like that that only comes yeah. from right. If you, if you believe the allegations Brendan. as they're stated, the man is a criminal. But like I said, having gone through the same then, yeah. very difficult um, process that he went through, I will um, tell you that we should. Ask you guys a question. Go ahead. Wong had what you say 160 billion dollars in exposure. 136 right? billion in exposure. Hundred and thirty-six out of one firm. Yeah, not many. Dollars. Not many guys are doing what he's doing. Hedge funds have been unregulated for a long time, and every time a hedge fund blows up, everybody says the same thing: How could these pools of money be unregulated? They have so much, you know, sway, and they have so much. Well, the reality is, um, if you fall under the Investment Advisory, uh, whatever Act of nineteen forty, the Investment uh, Advisors Act, you have to get SEC registered. And the thing about a family office is you don't. So basically, Juan got to cheat because he's a family office guy. The rest of the Tiger Cubs, which all of whom have outside money, they have to get audits, which a family office doesn't have to. They have to provide the audits to the limited partners. And they have to do an SEC inspection, which is uh, similar to seeing a procto financial proctologist. It's not easy. Um, so it's definitely a uh, difficult and extensive process. So I wouldn't 
you know, smell smoke and see fire? Are there other family offices um, doing stuff like this? Well, I think every single prime broker after the ARCA goes debacle is asking every family office, hey, uh, guys, uh, you, you got the money that you say you do, right? <laughs> That's sort of like the conversation that every prime has had with every firm, basically, I think. Wang was a known kind of outcast in the, in the Tiger community because he already had been nabbed for insider trading before. The other clubs, if, you, if you've worked there and stuff like that, like nobody likes to do 20x leverage. Like that's not something you wake up in the morning, you're like, let me just borrow 20 times the amount of money I have because you know what's going to happen. If you're wrong by 5%, you lose it all. Why would you work for 20 years to make a billion dollars and then say, yeah, you know what? All on red, let's go. <laughs> you know, it sounds like something someone from Wall Street Bets might do, but if you spend 20 it's years- more like, It's more like you put it on one roulette number. Yeah, all on, all on. Point. That's kind of my point is to the, the amount, and, and Martin, this isn't against you or anything. I don't want you to take offense. But no, the, the, the amount, the amount of, of people who will commit the crime or who have the propensity to do so, I think is probably less than you would imagine. I agree. And, and if you look at... Oh, hold on, Martin, hold on. It blows my mind that the conversation's not like... Yeah, that is kind of scary, right? Rather than, than taking the stance of, oh, no, that definitely doesn't happen. But Pete, I'm, like, not, I'm, not, I'm not telling you you're wrong, and I'm not disagreeing with you. There, yeah, it's, there a little, are it's a little scary. There are 100% criminals in, in, in this industry. I'm just... All right, all right. I agree it's a little scary. Let's go on a semi. Let's not beat a dead horse too much. Just wanted to chime in because I was short many of Huang's companies uh, huh. before we knew who it was. Yeah, it's kind of funny because at the time I was like, wow, somebody or I thought it was multiple entities were taking out these total return swaps. And I had no inkling that it was just one absolute madman with balls of steel. I've done um, it. I've done it before myself. And I, I, I was even one trade I did. I was conversing with a hedge fund that was looking at the market in that specific stock. And the guy was messaging me, who's doing this in this stock? Have you heard about this guy? He's going crazy in this one stock. And with a straight face, I responded, no idea. I wonder what he's up to. Meanwhile, I'm scrambling with those exact brokers trying to figure out how to fit out of this trade. Right. Here's my question. And Semi, you know, I, I thought about that, right? Because you could go back and kind of reverse put together the how that went down. And apparently, from what you just said, you saw it happening, right? It never but ends well. You, right, but how did you see it happening, Sammy? Like, where does that information Good question. come from? So, yeah. So there was uh, there were a couple Viacom and Discovery. I didn't pick out, but GSX was a oh, GSX was a like worthless company. Yeah, seventy percent yeah. of Discovery, and, and it just starts going absolutely nuclear it went up 500 percent my face and you got to wonder why and uh and that's when you start looking okay well who owns it and when you see total returns swaps for 80 percent of the float it, it starts to kind of come together well how do uh, you how do you see the those were they 13 g's how do you see the, do you see the trs in, in well the usually it's float. a 13 g or 13 f filed by the bank exactly so you, you know that Credit Suisse doesn't want to own a quarter of this company, and neither does uh, God. Who else? Goldman Sachs. So, all, and then uh, the you can see all you the can see ones. that there's a uh, gosh, who was it? Young Young King Yang. Yep. Somebody in Singapore bragged about this position. Uh, there's the article is still up there, but he was basically the most successful uh, hedge fund and. He bragged to Bloomberg about it, and that's that's when it really sort of came together. That okay, there there are some individuals that are uh, friendly with each other that are kind of getting in on the action in this way. Would you would you suspect maybe there's some smoke there? No, I think you're reading too much into it. The Tiger Cubs got a little too out of hand, being long everything because when they were long everything, they were up fifty percent for the year. Remember, and now that. They're long everything and sh short nothing. Drink a little bit of their own Kool Aid, right? Yep. Like all. You know, you know what? The, you know what the thing that gets me, guys, is that we're here, right? And like having this conversation, and I, I you guys know, I know you know that I bounce around these spaces, right? And it, I hear the nobles of the world, and I hear, you know, very sophisticated traders getting on these tire cups too for for whatever it is they're doing. So it's. It's 
funny to me to get like we're kind of defensive with for them here, right? Like, what's what's Noble's gripe with the Tiger Cubs or a guy like Mark Hodes? Well, I can tell you that Noble's gripe with Wang specifically was that he funded Kathy Wood. I mean, Noble's, Noble's gripe is Kathy Wood. An- another, cub, another Cub, right? No. Kathy Wood. Not no. no, not Kathy Wood. Stop right there. Yeah. Long, long <laughs> not seated her. Long uh, seated. You have, this, you have this case that makes these currently allegations, right? But they're pretty solid. And it's pretty scary if that's how it's run behind the scenes. One. Two. Just one guy, a- dude. Yeah, well, that's all we know about, right? And there's no yeah, transparency these, these, on the other end. All these schemes end up blowing up. You know, every one of them. Made off. Doesn't matter if you're honest. If Anytime you just borrow a bunch of money and throw it at the... You never... These guys don't stop. And again, I was once one of these guys. Like, there's an addiction. Dude, if, I, if I found... If I found... If I was in a position like that, right? And I found this glitch in the Matrix. And I, I'm hanging out with my boys and I said, Yo, listen to what I did. I've done it. I will tell you, eventually, eventually the banks want their money. That's what happened with Wong, and that's what happens with anybody. You might get away with it for a year. You might get away with it for five years. You might get away with it for 10 years. Eventually, you're going to up, and the banks say, hey, hey, you're down $30 billion. Uh, Well, when are you going to send that money over? Did you see that he was up to the, like, to the tune of 70% of Discovery's float? Yeah, at some point, like, right, was, like that's yeah, he had a billion dollars in total cash, right? Like that was the asset under management, and then he spun himself into one hundred and thirty of, of leverage. That's it's almost impressive. It is impressive, well, actually. And he, and he never saw it's not impressive. He didn't, it's he, didn't see, he didn't see the, the offering. He didn't see the offering coming. Right, the offering was disconnect. Could be that there's nothing new about this. Jerome Curvile at UBS. I know. Right, the guy took a billion dollar, five billion dollar flyer with UBS's money. He, if, if anything, we like look out for it, right? Like you know, it's like oh, there it is. Like right? you, you're you're looking for something like that, right? It's not it's not completely unbeknownst to us. That's right. When the market, especially when the market seems like it's behaving abnormally, for instance, a friend of mine are speculating right now that there was a Bitcoin whale that got um, destroyed. We were shorting Bitcoin at thirty thousand, and it was. Really, being really, really stubborn. It was really weird. The whole global markets were in meltdown, and Bitcoin was just sitting there, 30,000, 30,000, 30,000. Take everything you want. Sell me everything, 30,000 I'm buying. Well, eventually, Mr. Buyer's money ran out, and there was this delayed reaction for two weeks. Bitcoin could not fall, and then eventually, boom, 20,000, right? The bottom fell out, and, and that's that's what markets are. That's what happens. Like all of us, all of us were sitting there going, why is Bitcoin staying at 30,000? Yeah, why is the <laughs> riskiest, the riskiest asset in the world is holding like it in like a champ? And nobody's got any capital but, and sure should be putting any capital into it, right? How is it not going down? Right. And it's just because some guy who's sitting on a hundred billion says, you know what? This is the buying opportunity I've been waiting for. Let me run in and buy five billion. And it's like when Ashy Larry at, uh, uh, runs into the World Series of Dice at Dave Chappelle's uh, um, Chappelle show skit. Um, at, <laughs> if you remember that. Ashy, with Ashy Larry? Yes. Um, but jokes aside. Uh, yeah, I just posted something in the Nest. It's, I mean, it just got uh, shared like a couple minutes ago. Turns yeah. out Tiger Global Management has its first gain. All right. I thought it was appropriate. Let's make it all back. Baby. My cousin works at D1, and I just clown on him right now. It's quite, it's quite fun. 